All right, the time is now 6 p.m. I'm gonna go ahead and call our board meeting to order. Roll call has been taken. We'll go ahead and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, we're on to item three, which is to review, revise, and approve tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as written? Moved by Trustee F. Garris. Second by Trustee Witt. <clears throat> Any public comment on this agenda item? All those in favor for approving tonight's agenda, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to item four, which is to approve the minutes for the regular board meeting of September 12th. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? <clears throat> Moved by Trustee Witt, second by Trustee F. Garris. Any trustee comments? Any public comment on this agenda item? All those in favor for approving the regular board meeting minutes of September 12th, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to item five, which is public comment. <clears throat> the public comment portion of the meeting is set aside for the public to address the board as a body. It is not time for board response or for the public to ask questions. Do not infringe on the right of privacy of others. Please sign in and spell your first and last name. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. The chair may interrupt or terminate an individual if the statements are out of order. Any public comment? We do have public comment tonight. First up is Tim Chamberlain. Good evening. Whoop. Is it on? Yeah. Sorry. So good evening. Uh, tonight there's a few of us that want to talk a little bit about high school baseball. Oh. I'm sorry. Tim Chamberlain, T-I-M-C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-A-I-N. Good. Thank you. So tonight there's a couple of us that want to talk just a little bit about high school baseball. Um, what I'd like to do is offer a little bit of context as it relates to youth, youth baseball in Missoula. Um, I'm a little bit unique in that I just completed a five-year term as the president of Mount Jumbo Westside Little League. Last year, our Little League presented baseball opportunities to 480 players. Our neighboring, uh, our neighboring Mount Sentinel Little League provided baseball to 300 players. During the baseball season, Mount Jumbo uh, runs nine games every Monday through Thursday on eight baseball fields on a self-maintained 15 acres with full umpire crews and full-time ground crews. Further, in each of these last five years, Mount Jumbo Little League has won the District 2 pool play tournament, has won the District 2 district tournament, and has advanced to the state tournament. Just one win shy of making it to the, little, to the Little League World Series. And we do all of this for under $80,000. Now we've not been able to ascertain what the high school baseball committee came up with in terms of numbers, but certainly we can, we can provide high school baseball to 15 to 45 players per school for a fraction of this. As in most communities, the love of baseball begins at the Little League level, often four or five years of age. But unlike other states, the journey for Montanans, the baseball journey for Montanans, ends at the age of 14 as there is no high school option. Teenagers are welcome to try out for an American Legion team, but really those, those teams are reserved for the very best of the very best players and for those who can afford the many thousands of dollars it costs to, uh, to participate. As I stated in a letter addressed to the superintendent, the prince, all the principals and all of the athletic directors on January 4th, 2022. Our league and our community, we stand ready to help. Unfortunately, we have not received a single response to our offer of support. 
So here we are, nearly two, two years later, and we want to partner with MCPS to make this happen. And I'd like to begin by requesting that the topic of approving high school baseball be added to the October 10th, 2023 uh, MCPS board meeting agenda. The Missoula baseball community, we have the know-how, we have the relationships, and most importantly, we have the will to make this happen. So let's make this happen. Thank you so much. Our next public comment is from Missy McKulka. Ah, yes, there we go. Um, my name is Missy Michalka. My first name is spelled M-I-S-S-Y. Last name M-I-C-U-L-K-A. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Missy. Um, thank you for your service and countless unpaid and dare I say thankless hours and duty to Missoula County Public Schools. Um, I would like to take a moment to express my hopes for the high school baseball program in Missoula. Um, myself and countless other parents would like to see it move forward as rapidly as possible. To that end, many of us parents have been asking our ADs and principals questions about baseball. We haven't gotten any answers except that it will begin next year, and unfortunately we've heard this for two years now. So we started doing our own research to understand what it will take to get players on the field. Our conversations with MHSA have highlighted the fact that we can fundraise money to get this program off the ground in order to alleviate the money that's not in the budget for spring of 2024. Additionally, if the district requests it, MHSA will need to look into allowing the three schools, so Big Sky Sentinel and Hellgate, to temporarily co-op to keep costs down if necessary. As for fields, Mount Jumbo Westside Little League, Missoula Mavericks and even Paddleheads have all been willing to talk and are ready to make fields happen. And I have a fun fact for you tonight. Um, did you know that the 2024 high school state baseball championship is being held at, in Missoula at our very own Paddlehead Stadium? It would be a shame if Missoula didn't have our own representation there. Baseball parents are among some of the most helpful people I have ever encountered and we are all ready and willing to help get this going. I would like to formally request that the board add approving high school baseball to the agenda for discussion or action at the next meeting in October or possibly convene a special session sooner. Thank you so much for your time. The next public comment is from Harvey Powell. Good evening, this is on. Yep, so Harley Paw, first name Harley, H-A-R-L-E-Y, last name Paw, P-A-U-G-H. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, again, my name is Harley, and I come in front of you tonight uh, to give you four solid reasons why high school baseball should be a consideration uh, for Big Sky Sentinel and Hellgate. Reason one, by adding baseball to the list of sports, MCPS would continue to be a leader in creating a well-rounded athletic program that caters to the diverse interests and talents of its student body. Reason two, the inclusion of baseball will further enhance the educational experience at MCPS schools and provide students with opportunities for personal growth, physical fitness, and camaraderie. Reason three, high school baseball would provide a natural progression for hundreds of players participating in our local youth baseball programs as Tim and Missy had alluded to. We believe it would be a wonderful addition to the athletic program for MCPS and contribute positively to the overall high school experience of the student body. And lastly, number four, uh, we have a tremendous and enthusiastic community of youth baseball players, parents, and supports supporters here in Missoula, which Tim and Missy have already alluded to. 
Uh, next, I want to transition just to talk about kind of the financial aspects of the baseball program. Uh, within the last two weeks, I've had multiple discussions with three athletic directors from Western Montana who have gone through a full season this past spring. And I wanted to discuss with them their startup costs and just overall how did baseball go. From these discussions, I was given hard costs from the school. They were able to provide me with those, so I had some good numbers for um, transportation and uniforms and all those things, field rentals and things like that. And I took that data to develop uh, an estimated budget that covers the approximately the next four seasons starting uh, this year in 2024. Estimates work out to be under 45,000 per high school for startup costs and equal to or less than about 40,000 to operate thereafter. I would like an opportunity to discuss the budget in depth with the MCPS Board of Trustees and we'll provide a copy of the estimated budget um, that I have tonight uh, for the record if you guys are willing to take that. And also I have a questionnaire of um, you know, questions that I, I asked all the ADs to maybe help give you guys more context and provide some value as you assess the adoption of, of high school baseball. So in closing, I speak uh, for several parents in our community and request an MCPS Board of Trustees add approving high school baseball to the agenda for discussion or action in your next meeting in October. If a special session is required, a small group of parents would be in attendance and uh, stand definitely willing to help, as we had mentioned before. Uh, time is of the essence, and your action to move is very important to a lot of people. Uh, others and I he are here to Your work with the board. Your time's up. Please finish with a last statement. Yep, I'm just I'm just right here at the end. I said we are hopeful that a potential vote by the MCPS Board of Trustees will reflect the administration's commitment to continuously evaluating a comprehensive range of extracurricular activities that meet the interests and needs of its students. Thank you. Thank you. And we can't take anything right now, but please use our public comment email if you want to send anything to the board. Thank, Thank you. Us. Would anybody else like to make public comment at this moment? All right, so now we'll move on to item five, which are reports and announcements. And first one up is that there's no oral report for the health insurance trust fund. And then for item B are announcements from Superintendent Micah Hill. Over to you, Micah. Yeah, not a lot to uh, report. Uh, Surprisingly, things are going really well within the school district right now, uh, meeting with lots of different groups. But uh, we have our October 2nd uh, A and B count uh, coming up uh, pretty soon. So uh, that'll be the first count that we use to calculate A and B for the school district for determining next year's budget. And uh, so we're waiting to, to see where all the numbers shake out on that. Uh, and also just a quick happy birthday to Walena and Nancy. So happy birthday, both of you. Awesome, thank you. Now we'll move on to item seven, which is old business. First up is to approve second reading of policy revisions. And again, this is back over to you, Superintendent Hill. Yeah, so these were the first group of policies that we uh, brought forward. Uh, some of them I referred to as somewhat innocuous, uh, dealing with some language changes around defining marijuana, uh, different things like that. Uh, we have not had any public comment uh, regarding these policies as, as they've been out, so we haven't received any email correspondence or other correspondence regarding them. Any trustee questions? Trustee Decker? I apologize if this is something that um, came up when these were presented before. I'm not sure if I was there. But um, the marijuana free policy, um, do we, uh, I think how to say it exactly. I mean, marijuana is used as a medicine for many, many, many conditions, including by, you know, grandparents, parents, folks who might be coming to a school event for a variety of different reasons. And I'm just curious as to whether there's been any discussion about, um, about that. Well, I think the only thing that we would have concern about is if people were actually using uh, or, and or we knew they were under the influence, but if we did not know and if they weren't using on school district property, there would really be no uh, way to uh, enforce that, so to speak. 
Any other trustee questions? Trustee Mercer? So what is, if it's a guest, what would be the enforcement response to someone openly possessing? Uh, the same as if we saw someone with a can of chew or a pack of cigarettes or, you know, like one, should, you can have it. We may not even see it, but if we are using it on campus, we would go to you and say, uh, school policy, not allowed to use tobacco, marijuana, or alcohol products on, on school ground, so you need to leave. Any other trustee questions? Seeing none, this is a full board motion. Is there a motion to adopt the recommended revised policy as presented? Moved by Trustee Witt. Second by Trustee of Garris. Any final trustee comments? Seeing none, any public comment on this agenda item? All trustees in favor for approving the recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to item eight, which is new business. And the first one up is to ratify requests from Drummond School District to enter MCPS boundaries to transport students. And this is over to Mr. McHugh. Uh, thank you. So uh, this is not a common occurrence, but occasionally we have uh, requests by other districts to enter our district with their um, buses to transport students. Um, so here we have uh, students who are attending Drummond uh, High School and they're at the Drummond School Board is requesting your permission for their bus to enter our district to pick up uh, their students that are attending um, that high school. And so the uh, attached as uh, on page 28 is a proposed agreement that outlines um, an arrangement between ourselves, Drummond, and Clinton, because there are also some, uh, those, those same students are uh, uh, elementary students. There are elementary students involved as well. And uh, once this is signed, it would be submitted to the county soup and then approved by the transportation board. Um, happy to answer any questions. Any questions from a trustee? Seeing then this is a high school board motion. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? Moved by Trustee Avagaris, second by Trustee Mercer. Any final trustee comments? Any public comment on this agenda item? All trustees in favor for approving this recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now on to eight. A2, which is to approve the use of interlocal funds to support the purchase of high school science textbooks and supplies. And back to you, Mr. McHugh. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're requesting board permission to use interlocal funds. These are the funds that we deposit into the multi-district agreement between the elementary and the high school. Uh, these funds, in this instance, would be used to purchase some materials for science in the high school. Um, we haven't had many occasion to request board permission to use these funds. Um, we've accumulated approximately $3 million that are now held um, uh, in that account or in that fund. The, uh, um, the end of each year, the general fund, to the extent there are resources available unexpended, we've been transferring those to the multi-district or to this interlocal agreement. Um, so some of these, funds associated with this purchase represent recent transfers into the interlocal um, through the high school district. And, uh, and the, the timing didn't allow for the purchase to, purchases to be made with uh, year-end funds in the general fund. So um, this is a use of those funds as requested by the district to support some science adoptions at the three urban high schools. Any trustee questions? Trustee Decker. So over the time that I've been on the board, my understanding has been that mostly it has been the elementary district that has had additional funds available and that the high schools were for many years while I was on the board kind of floated by a transfer to the high school budgets out of this interlocal agreement. 
And right now we're in a time where the elementary enrollment is lower and the high school enrollment is higher. And we've been having discussions around our budget about the high school budget being in, in some ways, from some perspectives, maybe a healthier state than the elementary budget. And I'm surprised about two things. One, the amount of money that you just stated is in the interlocal currently is sort of surprising to me. Um, and then two, that the high school um, would, that, that we would be in need on the high school side. So maybe can you, I, I just, it seems like we're in a different situation than we maybe have been before. Sure, and, and part of it is at this point in the year, um, we've allocated our budgets um, for staffing, our general fund budgets. So we don't know where we'll sit at the end of the year because it's so early in, in the year. Um, when we've had um, um, budget savings and you can see the availability of budget savings, then um, this is you know a use within those allocated and approved budgets. And um, so part of this involves uh, um, timing, I guess you would say, because it does relate back to some year-end funds that were available in the high school general fund that weren't expended from the general fund before we closed that general fund out. And um, the other point, of, so, so in effect, you're, um, um, you're using funds that were available in the high school budget during the budget year in the, within the general fund to support uh, an appropriate uh, purpose within the general fund, appropriate educational expenditure. The, uh, the funds, um, as you know, when we transfer those into the interlocal, and this has been over a period of time, and we'll do a recap um, when we, um, next month in terms of our uh, year end closeout, but the elementary, when it has identified support, sort of this interlocal support, it's really been on paper. So we've identified it as supporting the high school um, through interlocal. When we get to the end of the year, to the extent we don't need those funds, we haven't used those funds. So there hasn't been an actual transfer. It, it, it's existed within the budget that if the funds are needed, it'll, it'll support those expenditures. It is true that the interlocal is made up mostly of in elementary funds. <clears throat> so the most of the deposits that have been made over the past five years have been elementary, but not exclusively. And while you don't separately manage the elementary and the high school within this interlocal, we know what's, what each district has contributed to the interlocal. And so this use doesn't exceed the available funds. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number, but I would say we're on a one third, two third sort of break it down of the $3 million. Trustee Mercer. Would publicly stating that breakdown violate any of the, or is it important for the interlocal to be mingled or can we have an accounting? Because I guess my experience, which is shorter than Trustee Deckard's has been, it's been entirely one way. I guess I have an expectation that as we have our budget problems next year, that it's gonna start flowing the other way and I guess as long as everyone's clear about that, I guess so my, so my question is, can we have a direct accounting or is that a problem? It's not a problem. We can absolutely do that. I think it's, the reason is, is the intent of the statute is that two districts, which we are two separate legal districts, would share resources for a common purpose or common good. So the funds by statute become co-mingled, but the contributions are well known, so we know exactly where the funds came from. Trustee Vogel. Um, the fact that the three urban high schools are the ones that are getting this puts a question in my head and it's probably gonna come out way meaner than I intended. But yeah, um, does Seeley get a portion of this or have they not even spoken up with a need? I mean, textbooks and supplies. It just seems a little unbalanced. Uh, great question. And uh, the request actually came through me uh, to Pat because there were promises made that um, the district would support the science electives at the high school after the last curriculum adoption. So we buy all these textbooks for biology or science, but then we have 
AP environmental science, and then we have chem two, or we have organic chemistry, or and these are our classes that are largely not supported um, when we do curriculum adoptions uh, because they're kind of some minor one-offs. And so this was a request that came through the the high schools, the three urban high schools last year, and there was no request, to my knowledge, it came from Sealy to need additional support in that way. But if there were, uh, we would bring the same request forward and say, you know, there, we need to have some amount earmarked for that as well. Yeah, and when we were doing agenda setting, that's one of the questions I asked too, is why we have four high schools, why only three? And so, but it did come down to their budgets and the amount of students we have at Sealy versus the three urban schools. But if you have a follow-up question, go for it. Um, is it also that maybe Sealy does not offer those other AP classes, stuff like that? They're they're a little bit more like restricted in in what they can offer because of space and staffing. Yeah, they're they're limited just by student population and and available FTE to student numbers. So, um, but if they were in need of beakers or whatever it is for just even regular science classes, we would want to support them through that as well. Any other Trustee Decker? And this is maybe trying to put this in t way too simple of terms, but is, it's kind of true that just high school is just a lot more expensive than elementary school in some ways, right? I mean, the ratios of students to teachers might be different, but high school programs are pretty expensive programs and we fund things differently. When you look at our budgets for things like transportation and field trips and all kinds of things. Um, and so I guess I just want, I'm just gonna ask that as a question, like are we, in general, is our is the, is high school more expensive? Because when we look at the interlocal and how that where it came from, but where it might go, I, I, that's just a question that I have. It is more expensive, and I think the state recognizes that because the per A and B entitlement or per A and B payment under the school funding formula is higher for grades eight through twelve, and part of that is recognizing the cost. And so, yes, you're you're correct, but. I think we've mentioned before um, in different contexts that um, that the that the, uh, the the source of the funds that are in that interlocal do not go unrecognized or un, um, unnoticed by us. I mean, we certainly track that and also understand where the two different uh, budgets budgets are heading um, between the elementary and the high school based on enrollment. Any Trustee Decker? I'm really sorry. Thank you for your indulgence of my need to chat all the time. Uh, I think the other reason why it's important is just for folks maybe to remember and acknowledge that when money is flowing from the elementary into the high school, um, Missoula City pays both of those taxes. We pay city and high school taxes when we live in the city of Missoula. And if you live in the county, you do not pay for the Missoula elementary. And so taxes that are being paid by folks who live in the city are contributing toward, the, we also pay for high school. But I guess I just want people to just know that that interlocal fund and the way that that has also extra supported the needs of high school is an example of the, you know, the folks that live in that elementary district are kind of contributing in that way. I think that's true and if I may, um, but the, I. I would be careful to frame it as fl funds flowing into the high school from the elementary because that's really not what's happening. Um, we have identified where that district could, um, the elementary district would um, uh, help the high school district balance during those real flat years in the form of a, um, a budget set aside in the elementary that would theoretically cover costs in the high school if those expenditures, if, if necessary. And we, we never did get to the point where it was necessary, fortunately. So a transfer or an expenditure offset never really happened. Just appeared on the budget. Mm -hmm. Any other trustee questions? Seeing and this is a high school board motion. Is there a motion? Moved by Trustee Decker. Second by Trustee F. Garris. Any final trustee comments? Trustee Mercer. I might be persuaded otherwise, but <clears throat> in a couple years, 
the three million dollars that Pat's done an amazing job of squirreling away is what is going to, I think, make the difference between crash or not. I think right now I am tend to respect at least to a large, large degree, what taxpayers put that in. And I would like to see an accounting, and I recognize what you're saying, that we haven't, that this is high school money they put in. When we start pulling out major amounts, I, I think it needs to bear a strong relation to who put it there, from my perspective. But I support this with the understanding that next year it's gonna be the elementary school probably asking to keep their art teacher by pulling money out or something. Any final trustee comments? Seeing none, any public comments on this agenda item? All trustees in favor for approving the recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to B1, which is to approve renewal cooperative sponsorship between Big Sky High School and Loyola Sacred Heart High School for boys wrestling. And this is over to Super Assistant Superintendent Shattuck. Thank you. So Big Sky High School is requesting uh, board approval to for a renewal application um, for a cooperative sponsorship between Big Sky and Loyola for boys wrestling. Uh, this agreement is for three years and it provides student athletes with um, more opportunity par to participate. Any trustee questions? CNN, this is a high school motion. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? Moved by Trustee of Garris. Second by Vice Chair Hobbins. Any final comments? All the, any public comment on this agenda item? All those in favor for approving the recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now to two, which is to approve the cooperative cooperative sponsorship between Big Sky High School and Loyola Sacred Heart High School for girls wrestling. Back to you, Assistant Superintendent Shattuck. Um, nothing new other than it's for girls wrestling. Any trustee questions? Seeing none, this is a high school motion. Is there a motion moved by Trustee F. Garris, second by Vice Chair Hobbins? Any final trustee comments? I have a comment. I just want to I'm glad we're able to do this with Loyola Sacred Heart and that we have this agreement with our schools. And so it's a good community partnership. Any public comment on this agenda item? All those in favor for approving the recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll go on to topic three, which is to approve enrollments for, for the early kindergarten program. And this is to a super, assistant superintendent, I can never say G. Jimona. Jimona is fine. Jimona. Yep, thanks. How do you say it? Jimona. Jimona. Yep. Thank you. Uh, this this mirrors uh, the approval request of last week. This uh, this is students that just didn't get added in time that have enrolled since the last deadline. So it's the same process as last week. Any trustee comments? Trustee Mercer. I ask this most every time, but I. I so this is capped by they had to meet certain testing or income requirement. Like what is the what is the restriction on this number not being much, much bigger? Well, you, yeah, that's a great question. So you have, you have guidance from the state. These are, these are special circumstances. So these students have to meet one of four criteria to be accepted into EK. Then it's based on the numbers in which we can provide by seats. So in the past, we had uh, 45 students that were at Jefferson, but we've since been able to disperse those out into three title schools. So we have... Um, the state allows you to have up to um, 20 students that can be in EK. We, we discussed between 15 and 18 at each title school. Right now we're at 15, 16, and 14, and then we have 29 that are at Jefferson. So it's just based on um, an allocated number from the state, which, which we could have, um, and then we've gone back and forth about what is based on size, need, fit in each, in each title school. Uh, we have not gone over 20. Trustee Mercer. When you say allocated, you mean allocated, we get a set number per school? It, it comes down to accreditation. They'll, they'll give you a set number of seats for those, and we can't go over those. So it's, it's, it's the set of 20 can be the most that we can have in, in a classroom. But we get more classrooms. You can, but that's provided with the grant that we have with the university. We have the funds for, th for three uh, schools right now within that grant. 
And then as we go, we could look at um, adding additional. The hope would be to have one in each building long term in each of our K-5 buildings. But right now, our grant allows us to have it at three sites. Can I add to just a little bit to that? So um, aside from the grant, uh, when we add early K classrooms, those are based off of current year funding, and we get reimbursed uh, after the fact. So the grant's what's allowed us to expand it to the three classrooms, but it, in any increase to classes, if space is available, the district would actually have to pay for that out of this year's budget in order to get the funding for the following year, if that makes sense. Trustee Mercer. And is the grant necessary to make, is A and B fall short and the grant makes up the difference between A and B and the costs or also? Or? We don't get A and B for the first year. That's the grant covering it. And then if we continue into next year, we could, we could have A and B for the program. All of our funding is always based on the year prior enrollment. So if we decrease students this year, our funding stays the same from the last year. Sure. But then going into the next year, we would have less funds even if we had more students. But we get A and B. This kid, DJ, DG, we're getting A and B for him in the fall in the following year. Yeah, right. But we're getting year. money. I mean, yeah, okay, it's one year yeah. delayed, but money's money. I mean, it's still money. Well, right. But the idea that it's and like he say, won't be there next if year. If I was so. going to add a class, I need to add staffing. So I have a teacher to pay for materials to pay for, curriculum to pay for, all of those things that the A and B is part of that funding formula. We don't have the funding well, to do that. I hear the difficulty of growing this year, but regarding to the funding stream, does A and B fall short of what it costs per kid? Uh, complicated question, but generally speaking, if you were to say, uh, the average AMB for an elementary student is $5,000 and you have 15 kids, you do the math on that, roughly, you know, pays for itself um, in, in terms of moving forward into the following year. Any other trustee questions? This is an elementary motion. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation? Moved by trustee of Garris. Second by Vice Chair Hobbins. Any final trustee comments? Any public comment on this agenda item? All elementary trustees in favor for approving the recommendation, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to item four, which is to approve policy revisions and new policies for first reading. And this is over to you. You. <laughs> Superintendent. All right. Sorry, Take I have it. Vinny again, so I'm like, wait, <laughs> Vinny, do you want to? <laughs> yep, we're going to kick it over to Vinny now. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, coming before you tonight are some new uh, policies that we haven't reviewed, but the first on the list is policy 2132, which is one that we reviewed at the last meeting, but we wanted to get some clarification on a few things and would like to uh, provide some of that, reach back out to um, legal counsel uh, regarding some of the questions that, that came up during the discussion. Um, one of the questions was in and around the use of uh, 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 parental rights being um, not including guardians. And the response to that was that uh, the lack of the use of the word guardian is intentional because guardians only have rights afforded to them by the courts or by law. And fundamental rights are something that are protected through constitution. And so that was the reason for the exclusion. So this, it's not a, a fair statement to say parents and guardians have fundamental rights. Only parents have fundamental rights. Guardians have rights that are afforded to them through the law or the courts. Um, the other part of that, um, you know, when, when we talk about it in the, you know, uh, you know, in accordance with common law, state and federal law, uh, that was meant to be uh, uh, not in spite of the law. Uh, it's limiting language. Um, and what they said particularly about that is that, um, uh, let's see, got to find my highlights here. Such rights are only recognized in, in accordance with the law, not in spite of the law. So that was part of the discussion about, you know, the statement at the very beginning of it. And, and they're very uh, committed to this is the statement that needs to be um, in the policy. Um, and then at the end um, of that particular policy, we talked a little bit about defining survey and um, uh, personal information. And the, uh, 
this policy actually originates in federal law. It's the Pupil Protection Rights Act that was adopted at the federal level. Um, and in that particular law, they don't define uh, survey or personal information. And it was against the advice of counsel to try and insert a definition into a federal law that doesn't exist. Um, save for the fact that it's, it does say that, uh, uh, where was it? Um, survey uh, includes evaluation was the only uh, mention of a definition of the word survey. So again, their recommend, recommendation to us is to move the policy forward without any recommended changes to the language on that. So any questions? We'll go through them one by one like we did the last one. Trustee Witt. Just want to go to like the, one of the first comments, making sure I get it right. So when they say parental rights and you're saying parent, I, when I go to that House Bill 676, which is now MCA 40-6-701, it defines parent as biological parent of child, an adoptive parent of child, or an individual who has been granted the exclusive right and authority over the welfare of a child under state law, which to me, is a guardian that? Are they, are they not under state law, like by given it by the court? I'm if, just. If, if it was an adoptive situation, that okay. would potentially, but just like if I had guardianship over a niece or a nephew, that doesn't necessarily mean that I have the fundamental rights of a parent. So you weren't, so a guardian, because I, like, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, and I don't understand. I don't know what the legal guardian is, but that's not someone that was given the exclusive right or authority of a welfare of a child under the state law. Because if it were, then they would be counted as a parent in this, but if not, then, but I don't know how a guardianship works. Never been involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't either. I just, I'm kind of repeating back what was expressed to me in terms of the definition of between guardian and, and fundamental parent, right? Okay. Trustee Mercer. So then it's our council's understanding of the main first sentence that it's really saying all fundamental rights of the parents, fundamental parental rights are exclusively reserved, you could effectively say in accordance with the common law. That it's the reservation that's in accordance with common law, constitution, whatever. Okay, if that's how we're understanding yeah. it, that. Yeah, the reference to fundamental rights is a reference to the level of constitutional protection that is granted to that particular right. Fundamental rights are those given the highest level of protection against governmental action or interference. A fundamental right can only be subject to governmental action or interference that is narrowly tailored to the compelling state interest. Right, and so then sort of narrowly, narrowly tailored substantial interest test is what the second half of the sentence is the in accordance part. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I have grammar problems with that, but I understand if that's how we're going to interpret that, that's cool. Um, to the guardian thing, I mean, it's down below. There's like parental consent is required for students under do the blah, blah, blah. I mean, there we're going to take a guardian, right? That's going to count as parental consent. Fine. Um, and if we don't want to define survey because no one else wants to define survey, I'm, I'm good with that. I just, so the thing on the, Next page, personal information for this section only, so it's the middle of 38. Mm -hmm. You're saying that the section is everything below the italic collecting, that that's a section? Not this whole policy. This policy is not a section. Right. It's just that little bit of the policy. OK. Any other trustee questions, comments? Trustee Decker. I am curious as to what, if anything, we anticipate being changes in practice based on this change in framing of stuff. Like what, what's this gonna do for people in the schools? What are the, what are the speed bumps? What are the problems? What are the things that are gonna, what does this mean? Essentially nothing. Um, it just, it was something that was uh, codified. Um, you know, most of the policy in and of itself remains the same. One of the things they were trying to do, there was actually an issue with um, 
the youth risk behavior survey that OPI put out and whether or not it was a, simply an opt-out survey or if you had to have parental consent in order to um, give the survey. And, and keeping in mind, uh, OPI puts out a couple of surveys uh, every other year once the youth risk youth risk prevention, needs prevention survey, and the other one is, um, oh, it's, I'm gonna, it's escaping me right now. Um, anyway, they do two of them. Um, and so then, but then the question became, can schools force students to take a survey that doesn't collect personal information? And again, coming back to the policy and going back to federal law, no, you still need to make parents aware they have the option to opt out. Um, and so, and, and again, an assurance from the district or uh, whomever it may be that we're not collecting personally identifiable information from students. So at, at the end of the day, nothing fundamentally changes for how we act or interact. Um, we're just giving credence to the fact that the state legislature identified fundamental parent rights and included in this the, the language around not surveying kids. I'm sorry, I, I feel like this shouldn't be quite so confusing, but so that this, if like the youth risk behavior survey, which clearly I think was the source of a lot of stress, um, is an anonymous survey. Mm -hmm. So can you explain to me the distinction between if we are or if we aren't collecting personal information? Um, this is about all surveys, whether or not we collect personal information. So an anonymous survey now falls under the consent must be obtained. Mm -hmm. And so was that already our practice? Statewide, it probably wasn't yeah. typically practiced, but it is going to be our practice? Um, good question. Yeah, I don't know yet. Sometimes you, what you do is when those surveys come out, they come out with a lot of uh, information and guidance from OPI on here's how this is expected. Um, you know, and, and even then, you know, surveys voluntary. Um, I'm not aware of any surveys that we're currently giving that uh, would collect any identifiable information. Um, and truth be told, surveys are, they take up a lot of time, they take a lot of effort, there's a lot of data collection, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Some of them are really pertinent and useful. They help guide and, you know, decision making and, and grant writing and some other things where we collect really good information from our students. Um, and then there's other ones that, you know, we'll get requests from random organizations, random groups, oh, would you survey the kids? We want to know X. And so we, a lot of times we decline those. All right, if there's no other final questions, we'll move on to the next one, 3210. All right, 3210 is uh, largely unchanged, uh, the policy in and of itself. It just includes the legal reference to policy 3225 uh, and some of the code changes. Um, so almost everything in there is, is identical. And we'll get to 3225 in a minute, and that's just the cross-reference. No questions on that. We'll just go ahead and move on to 3225. All right, 3225. Um, if you look, the, the first part of the policy remains pretty unchanged, and then you start getting some addition in there, uh, and then a lot of deletion and just basically a total rewrite of, of this policy. Um, and uh, just quite frankly, it, it's a great policy, and I, I appreciate the way that it's written. Um, if you look at uh, some of the things that are in there, Harassment, intimidation, and bullying can take many forms, verbal, written, electronic, visual, physical, and psychological, and is often but not always associated with race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or physical differences. So right away, we're defining, and then we're coming back and we're saying that here's how we're going to respond as a district. Number one, we don't tolerate it. Number two, if, we, if this is going on, here are the avenues to report. It addresses both uh, staff and uh, adults and student behavior. Um, and so this is one of those ones that I think they did a really great job of, of crafting the language. It gets into the differences when it comes to Title IX uh, sex discrimination. It gets into ADA discrimination around 504. Uh, and so, and it just lays out all of those um, options and, and th things that students, parents, staff can do um, if they suspect this is going on. Any trustee questions or comments on this one? Trustee Witt. First, uh, I agree 
well written knowing what some of those laws say. I really appreciate how it was crafted. Uh, but to steal what I'm assuming would be Grace's question, how will this affect <laughs> what we are already doing? Because I wasn't catching where, like a lot of wording changes to comply with things, but not a whole lot of things on the ground is what I was seeing. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think a couple of different things have happened. Title IX has changed um, substantially in, in, in terms of how it's being handled or, or how a district or um, any organization really has to process it. It really turns a school district into um, a, a court um, where certain rights are afforded. You can't, you know, take disciplinary action against a kid who uh, is alleged to have committed something. And there, so we get some different interpretations of different guidance coming out of uh, the uh, Department of Ed, um, Office of Civil Rights, uh, different things. So it's trying to kind of coalesce some of that. Uh, and, and make sure that the language is really clear. Um, and I think as different cases come up and, and different things are tried in the courts, they're seeing more and more ways to try and tighten up this language. Um, generally speaking though, um, this policy doesn't significantly change the way that we're going to operate or how, how things have happened or been dealt with in the past. Uh, but there are certain procedural safeguards and different things that have to be in place that we have to follow and honor. Trustee Mercer. Uh, two questions. Top of 44, <clears throat> complaints will be kept confidential to the extent possible given the needs of the investigate. How does that interact with sort of parental rights to know? If there's an allegation by a student, do their parents get told or can their parents inquire? If there's an allegation against a student, do their parents know? Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, I think any, anytime anything can result in discipline, uh, parents need to be notified, and that's the responsibility of our administration to, to do that. When it comes to um, uh, especially Title IX and the way that the, the current guidance is, is put out there, um, there really is no right to privacy. You start collecting information, you start taking notes, and the offending party or the alleged offending party get, is privy to all of that information. They get to know what your interviews were, all of that, and, and goes the other way as well so that the reporting party also, everybody has kind of this equal opportunity to defend themselves um, in the eyes of, of that particular law. So it, it's, a, it's a really interesting process to be engaged in, um, especially if it's student to student, it could be staff to student, staff to staff, um, it, it's complicated. So are you saying then that confidential really means here not public? It's going to be disclosed quite liberally to all the sort of involved parties, right? It, yeah. it just it does mean it's not public. Okay. Right. Where some things are confidential, like we would never discuss what consequences someone has received or, or anything like that. We still have to live within the rules of FERPA uh, and protect the student's confidentiality in that regard as, as far as an educational record. Um, but there are other things that, you know, um, even if I didn't disclose to a parent that student A uh, did something to student B, student B would be able to tell their parent it was student A. Does that mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that we will, if something's alleged to have happened to someone at school, we will tell their parent. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so my second point is on now page 45, you're talking about there's this kind of regardless of the reason repeated a couple times that bullying is blah, blah, regardless of the reason. I like that. I think that's super clear and powerful. Back on page 42, the first bolded thing about no person including, and then it says, uh, based on provisions of applicable local, state, federal law and regulations that prohibit discrimination. And you could be like, well, in Montana, certain discrimination is now allowed. Why not just make it the very powerful thing that you have there based on any reason, for any reason, just make it, bullying is bullying. Bullying is not about the why, it's about the, the doing. It's about the, the act of aggression to me. And whether that reason is anything doesn't matter. It's the, it's the harassment that is, we're trying to prohibit. So I just thought that was stronger. That's my comment. Trustee Decker. I will say that, that I actually put a star by that little section because I really like that 
passage, and I really like the statement that it's the policy of the board to comply with all non-discrimination laws. I think that some of the actions that we are trying to respond to now put us in a difficult position of um, understanding what um, we may be asked to do around, you know, perceived or real conflicts between um, new laws and existing discrimination uh, laws at various levels. <laughs> and so this statement makes it very clear that we, um, where we stand on discrimination and what that looks like while saying that bullying, hazing, and intimidation are often very related to the very statuses that are about discrimination too. I think it's important to say that in our bullying policy because um, actions that are related to a person's um, identity and status um, often do rise to the level of bullying and can be identified as such because of that. So I really liked the framing of this. I thought this was, this took a lot of work. It's a much clearer policy, like throughout, it's much more consistent. Um, and I also think it's stronger and I like that section. Although I see what you're saying. Any other trustee questions or comments? Trustee Martin. I do like the final sentence. It's policy to comply with all non-discriminations. I guess my concern is just that there is certain discrimination that is now allowed under state law. All right, are we okay with that one to move forward to the next one? All right. All right, uh, 4330, um, if you look on the uh, summary page on 35, it has a, quite a, a long definition of defining sexually oriented performances. Uh, and if you look at the policy, the revision is just uh, an underlined sentence that says sexually oriented performances are not permitted on district property. Trustee Mercer. What's the definition of sexually orientated performance? I know that. It, it, intended to appeal to a purient interest. It's very vague. The law does not define that any further. Just so you know. Um, so, who, who will it determine? Really detailed. Yeah. <laughs> I keep reading, and yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's just that whole thing. I guess I'm thinking of speech and debate. I'm thinking of drama, and I'm thinking of who's going to decide what is a sexually oriented performance. So let me ask that question: Who decides? if someone challenges that such and such play that the drama club wants to put on is sexually oriented because it's Moulin Rouge or whatever. Yeah, I, I think there's a... Um... Is it you? I mean, that's just a straight... Yeah, is it who, sure, I'll do it. Is that who decides? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> uh, but when, I, when you get to, you know, the, the further definition, right, that's um, exposing body parts, it's uh, stripping, it's, you know, prosthetic genitalia. It, I mean, it just gets into a really, um, I'm sorry, what's that? page 35. Trustee Witt. And, and what I would, in general, what I would say is we've, we've never allowed sexual performances on district property prior to this. Yeah, I don't. Like, well, I, I see where you're, you're saying in there, you know, like the prosthetic genitalia, breasts, buttocks. It says things like that. It says stripping. Um, as defined, the law is really, uh, it starts off with definitions about what a drag king and a drag queen are. And, but it doesn't actually specifically address that further which is kind of interesting. And the main thing is someone can bring it up and there can be a $5,000 penalty for violating this law. But as far as who does it, I'm, it, it has like, it brings it into court 
so like, yeah, I don't know where this truly ends up. Yeah, it, and I think part of it, when you go back to the policy it's, it's itself, it's the use of school facilities. And so if someone said, hey, we want to come and use, you know, the Sentinel Auditorium to put on a sexually oriented performance, we have a policy that says, sorry, we can't allow you to do that. Would you agree that, like, so let's say that something was where a parent says this was a sexually orientated performance and we may all disagree with that but this one parent brings it up would they they would have to go to court and prove that is the way i'm kind of reading they this. could they could file a complaint under policy 1700 and go through a process um, where it could ultimately be heard by this board to make the determination um, but if the administration determines that it's not then it's not uh, keeping in mind that we also have Senate Bill 99 from the previous legislative session, which says we have to give 48 hour notice and annual notice of anything that might be sexualized. And then people have the opportunity to opt out. Trustee Decker. I appreciate the simplicity with which this is added to the use of community facilities placement. I mean, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if we're on comments or questions or what, but I just feel like I have to say that this, we are being asked to do this in response to a bill that it was explicitly about drag shows, spe specifically and explicitly to create a chilling effect on an art form that is practiced by the LGBTQ community. That's what this is for. And it is my, I am very, um, it's, it's unfortunate that we even have to have this conversation in this way. And I appreciate the needle that is being attempted to be threaded by finding a way that is true to this community and continues to support and uplift the LGBTQ community at a really difficult time um, when this, um, when something that is empowering to, uh, to folks uh, drag is being used in such an inflammatory way. Um, and I hope that folks who, you know, clearly hundreds of people are watching this right now or whatever, <laughs> but I really hope that people understand that, the, that, that, um, that queer kids matter in our community and that we support you and that we support your culture and your art. Um, and that this is not a problem that has existed in this district. And it is not a, like, this is a solution in search of a problem in this district. So, so we're, and we're all clear that, so I guess what you're saying, uh, that the legal reference to House Bill 359, which will be a code reference, it would be clear to everyone that was trying to abide by this, that that's where they would go to find the definition they're supposed to, that's what that triggers for everyone, okay. All right, any other final comments or questions for 4330? Seeing none, so we'll move on to the next one. Uh, 8301, I think is the one we're on. Um, this one got a, a pretty significant overhaul, um, which I think it was probably past due. Uh, the last uh, adoption of this was um, 2015. Uh, so it's been a little bit, um, it does include some new language um, in and around uh, safety, uh, particularly as it relates to safety plans and um, threat assessments and the requirement of school districts to uh, revisit um, monthly uh, school safety teams, uh, their plans and those kind of things. Um, I think it was maybe day five, um, I was handed this 100 page employee safety program book and it had my name on it already. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't write this. Um, but if you would like to know anything about lifting procedures and uh, bloodborne pathogens, all that stuff, we, we certainly build that plan uh, as a general um, governing uh, safety plan for all employees. But then also um, Tyler and, and uh, Assistant Superintendent Jamona uh, spend quite a bit of time um, 
uh, developing safety plans for our schools. Uh, we have threat assessments. We have all of the things that are, they were already in place uh, even before this policy revision happened, but it does reference several times in here uh, the district safety plan. Um, just want to assure the, the board that we have those and that they're um, in operation. We have monthly safety meetings. We do tabletop exercises. We do uh, a lot of things along those lines um, to continue to improve safety. Questions or comments on 8301? Trustee Mercer. So uh, middle 49, superintendent's authorized to close the schools. Is there another policy somewhere that defines the superintendent to include someone else if you're away? Or, or should there be a or designee there? Yeah, we actually have a um, school closure plan um, that uh, identifies a, a chain of command for that decision making. And, and sometimes that decision making can even involve the county superintendent. It can involve uh, uh, other people within the district. A lot of times the ability of whether or not you're going to open or close, say due to weather, uh, is whether or not the buses can run. Um, so it's those kind of things that help dictate that a little bit. But um, I guess if I were uh, incapacitated, <laughs> In Bali, <laughs> uh, I would let Amy make the decision. So, <laughs> and I don't mean to. I guess just being legally is this doesn't say that. This says you are authorized. It doesn't say anyone else is authorized. So if you want someone else to be authorized, you either need to have another policy that defines someone else as the quote superintendent while you're away, or it should say something like. Yeah, there's actually a lot of policies that say superintendent or designee. Right. So that's, uh, that would be my suggestion, or designee, Yeah. because it doesn't have that. It, uh, it would just make it Yeah, if we want to add that, or, or we can put it into a, a handbook or, or somewhere else, too. But ultimately, someone has to make the decision. So we but can do I, designee. I'm not complaining. I'm just, just legally easy writing. These other ones don't matter, because these are things in advance, and you know you do that in advance. But this one's an emergency, and... I just, I think a designee should be able to do it. You can add designee. It's easy. Vice Chair Hobbins. That would be for all of those though, right? Um, not just the school closure. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, the other one, I don't, I don't think it would hurt, but the other ones are more like, she'll take regional measures. I mean, those seem more perspective, right. right? Things he's doing all the time. Whereas the closure is a like, right now, this moment, yay or nay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Now we'll move on to 1650. Did this capture anyone's attention? Charter schools. Uh, so this is actually pretty good timing um, that we're reviewing this and, and con contemplating. This would be a brand new uh, policy that we're adopting for the very first time. Um, the Board of Public Ed just uh, put out the application uh, and uh, all the requirements for uh, school board publicly controlled charter schools. Um, and there was actually some questions going around about is MCPS going to apply? Um, and I would say that in the next uh, month or so, the board could be seeing some applications for charter schools from the administration uh, for MCPS. Um, so schools like our online academy can now have charter school status and we can receive additional funding for them. Uh, you could uh, potentially have any number, um, but this policy is one that uh, kind of puts it together. Um, looking at it, it it's an interesting, uh, it, the way it's written is pretty interesting because it says the Board of Trustees may submit an application to the Board of Public Ed, but it also says an individual or entity that is not affiliated with the district may request that the board create a school or program within the district. And so then what you potentially have is someone coming in and saying, gee, we would like to have a STEM charter school, K-8. Great. And then what you're probably going to hear from the administration is, we already do those things. And we actually would not support the creation of that. And the board can make the decision about whether they want to support it. It would be under the jurisdiction of the board. You would be hiring and, and doing all of the things that you would do for any of our other schools. 
Um, so it's, a, it's interesting. The one thing that I would say on this one um, is in that second sentence in the um, first paragraph, the word adopted is at the end of the sentence and it doesn't actually make sense, at least to me. And I think it needs to say that uh, an application for a public charter school must be consistent with the district's adopted mission and vision specified in its strategic plan for continuous improvement period. So I think that was just a, an inadvertent typo. It, it just didn't make sense to me the way that it was written. So it would just be a structural thing that um, I actually didn't catch until today. But Any trustee questions or comments? Trustee Whip. It talks about in denying a request, the board shall explain how the school or program operates that and the process to access such school or program or the deny because it's not consistent with the district's mission and vision. Are those laid out in the law as like, these are the only reasons you can deny it? Because it kind of sounds like no, those are the I mean, way you, we deny it and the only can, reasons we can and that we have to go do all this explanation. No, you just, you have, there's nothing really that's laid out in, in why you deny it, but even if you do, they have recourse to go back to the Board of Public Ed and ask that it be uh, implemented anyways. So you wanna be really solid on, if you're gonna deny something, um, you wanna be really solid on your rationale for why. Because Board of Public Ed can come back and say, too bad, you're doing it. Trustee Mercer. We're doing it or they can do it under? Under the Board of Public Ed. Okay, but they couldn't force us to take one that we didn't want, or could they? I mean, it would be in our area, blah, 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 but it wouldn't be under our. Um, I think it is under this board. I um, watched one of the OPI community talks, and even in there, they couldn't fully tell us if it would be us as a school board or a school board they elect, the, the charter school. There was no concrete, um, and this was in, it's recorded if you go to OPI Parent Resources. Yeah. And there, in that, they couldn't even tell us what was what. Yeah, so there were two charter school bills. This is one that MTSBA and that we actually supported. We're, I'm not opposed to MCPS having a charter school. Uh, like, let's talk about it. Let's see what we want to, what we could come up with. Can we afford to do it? Can we find the staffing? Do we have the enrollments? Um, there's some stipulations as to the maximum number of students initially. Uh, it's a five-year um, status, and then you have to reapply. Uh, Board of Public Ed is the one that makes all the decisions. The application is pretty lengthy. There's like 24 questions. You have to answer them. You have to be able to demonstrate, you know, why um, there's the need, et cetera. The other charter school bill was, is actually um, enjoined right now. It, there's an injunction um, on constitutional reasons, um, which we were very supportive of. Uh, Montana um, Quality Education Coalition, of which I'm a, a member, I'm a board member. Uh, we basically sued the state and said, yep, this isn't okay. Uh, so it was enjoined um, and looks like it'll have a really tough uphill battle. Interestingly enough though, um, some public schools uh, and former principals have joined with the state in support of that other charter school bill. Uh, and, but that is one that has no rules. So every rule, every standard, every policy we adopt, none of that applies to that other type of charter school, but they get all the public funding for it. So that's part of our, what's in our craw, uh, so to speak, about that particular bill. Um, and uh, yeah. So what you're referencing, Melina, is, is absolutely right. There's, that would be a board that would be elected by, the way that bill was written, it's a board elected by the parents of that charter school. Trustee Mercer. So in the middle paragraph, it just says anyone can make a request. And if they do, we at a minimum have to have a committee established to deal with that. But you were saying they have to per OPI or whatever, we have to do a, they have to do a lengthy application. I wonder if it would be, maybe this is, won't ever be a problem, but I, I'm a little bit hesitant to allow an open-ended thing that would encumber this board to mandated respond to it versus is there any requirement that it has to be on the full application or is there any initial screening? Is there anything before they can just trigger us having to respond to it or, and maybe it won't be abused. Do they have to, 
can we say they got to fill out the, the required applicant pursuant on an application you know? yeah I would I would I would I would I would guess so this is all really new to me to Montana in general the application that came out today I've, I've glanced through it I haven't given it a full uh, uh, read but the interesting thing is the looming deadline of November 1st applications have to be submitted by November 1st um, and it's Board of Public Ed, there's limited funding, there's, you know, so there's limited resources, so it's really capped and, and restrictive. Um, but I know that Billings, Helena, Bozeman, uh, and Great Falls right now are all planning to submit applications for one or more charter schools in their district. I didn't want to be left out. <laughs> Actually, there have been some great ideas that have been, been brought forward about it, so. Um, Any other trustee questions or comments? Our, yep, Trustee Decker. It's maybe a request. I mean, charter schools are, that's, that the very phrase is some kind of fraught and complex and people have heard about charter schools from a variety of different sources and probably have really different levels of information about what we're even talking about and it's brand new so maybe i would make a request that if it's possible we do we've talked about the idea of doing like some 5 p.m work sessions or learning sessions or things like that i feel like especially if this is something that our board is going to be asked to take action on in a short order we might want to get ourselves pretty well up to speed on what the what the topics and issues might be around it so that we can make as informed of a decision as we can yeah i i'd be very open to that we'd love to be able to put on a some sort of a presentation and, and just a work study so that we're clearly defining what it is what it is not um, and then how that could look at mcps going forward would that be something you'd want to do sooner than later like the for october 10th Amy, Amy, clear your calendar. <laughs> so we're already doing a 5.30. So that would... Get your hair cut. Um, well, if, we could do a special meeting if needed to for, for this. We could assume that people could tune into if they want. We're on first reading of this, right? So we, should we make sure that everything here goes through and then think about we can when also we get would like an comment. education thing? Because it, you know, it seemed like kind of a little early or a little rushed. Trustee Decker. I think that it may be that we'll need time to deal with this policy, but the law did, I mean, it has, did in fact pass. I mean, so w this is going to be something that our board needs to learn about. Trustee Mercer? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you're saying there's a high probability that prior to November 1, there will be a recommendation to the board to adopt it, or that's at least realistic possibility, then yes. I mean, I guess I would, and I guess I don't know, like, does a work session have to have a quorum? Can it be Zoom, whatever? I'm going to be gone the 10th one too, so for whatever that's worth. Yeah, so a um, couple of things. One, I would not want to miss an opportunity um, for MCPS to uh, uh, potentially uh, create char a charter school or two um, under the MCPS umbrella. Um, policy is policy, the law is the law. We can move forward with, um, at, you know, a board vote to create a charter school it's still just an it still would even have to be approved by the board of public ed they've given a timeline uh, for that but we'll need some time to uh, put that together but maybe the the solution is to do a work study uh, around the same time that we would ask the board to approve a charter school and if after the work study questions aren't answered and you don't feel comfortable moving forward with it we can always say no nope, let's push push it to the back burner till next year um, but I just, I wouldn't want to miss that opportunity right now. That's just my two cents worth. All right, any other questions or comments in regards to 1650? All right, now we'll go on to 2423. 
All right, this is a new policy as well. Uh, personalized learning opportunities, if you've had a chance to read it, um, it's, it's actually fairly basic, but if you look at uh, some of the language that's in here, this is some of the same language that was in and around the Innovative Education Program tax credit, which there was that one year where it was a million dollars and last year it was two million. MCPS was actually able to uh, get a little bit of that. Um, and uh, so this aligns with our advanced opportunities uh, grant uh, that we currently receive. Um, and that's ongoing funding from the state. Uh, we're applying for the transformational learning grant. Uh, that is also in alignment with that. Uh, the teacher clarity work that we're focused on for this year, um, our CTE, our ag ed, our experiential learning opportunities, all of those things really fit under this umbrella. Um, the interesting thing is that these things in, in the next couple are actually in the administrative rules of Montana, and they're actually asking to see these types of things being addressed in your uh, uh, strategic plans and in other documents uh, within the board, and so one of them comes in the form of a policy. Questions or comments? All right, seeing it, so now we'll move on to the next, 2332. All right, 2332 is really the result of a uh, Supreme Court case that just was recently litigated, um, and it was Kennedy versus Bremerton School. Uh, basically, a coach was praying at the end of a football game. Uh, he was asked not to, uh, under the belief that the, there's a separation of church and state as previously defined by the Supreme Court. Um, eventually, uh, this coach was fired uh, and they brought suit um, against the school district, uh, made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said it, it's not a separation, but rather a balance of church and state. And what the argument was, was this coach was praying after the game. No one was compelled to pray with him. No one was compelled to do anything. It was just his expression. And the court said, you know, gosh, we're, is, can he use his cell phone during that time? Can he talk to a parent? Could he give his uh, significant other a, a kiss? Could he celebrate? The, what, what else could happen during this time? If this really isn't being time that was specifically addressed to supervising students in the, in the scope of his work, then it's not a separation of church and state. It's a balance. And so the way that the policy is, is really being written, um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't fundamentally change anything that we're currently doing. Uh, as far as a school district, all the things re remain the same. We're not asking clergy to come in and, uh, you know, give a prayer before uh, a graduation ceremony. We can't compel, nor can we deny, nor can we suppress, nor can we encourage. Um, and again, this is for any religion. It's not just for uh, Christianity. So. Um, it just goes on to kind of further define, you know, what does religion look like in the curriculum? Uh, what about religious clubs? All of those various components. Um, the optional is because, well, with any policy, the board, you know, doesn't have to. You recognize that there's a law. There is a Supreme Court case that that address this specific issue. And so being proactive as, as a board and being able to say, here's where we land on this um, is probably the, the reason that it's optional. Any interesting questions or comments? Trustee Witt? Uh, definitely understand the environment and to why this is coming up. And yeah, I generally agree with being proactive, but I, I wanted to point out there, a few things in here I really appreciated, which were like uh, in the second paragraph, does the right to engage in voluntary prayer does not include the right to have a captive audience listen or to harass other students. And I really enjoy the captive audience thing and saying like, yeah, you can do these things. You're allowed to do them, but you cannot do it with that captive audience. So I just really appreciate that there's that wording in there so that we're not getting people that are entrapped because this is Missoula we we're diverse for Montana not overly diverse but diverse for Montana and we have people of various religions and yeah I like that we're not trapping anyone in there so like overall I think if we're going to have a policy 
this for the most part seems to be pretty well written. Wait for what the lawyer next to me has to say the, with wording changes. <laughs> but overall, I like the way it's, it's done to, to make sure that everyone has their rights and that that includes the right to not be present for it. Any other trustee questions or comments? Trustee Mercer. I, mean, I guess I like the cap of two and I guess encourage discourage and I guess I would say that the debate in the question or the case you posed to me is what is the pressure imposed by that team environment of that school team to participate in that particular it, if the coach is presenting some particular amount of prayer it takes a certain amount of courage to walk out on the coach even though you're free to go but that's still just so I think I hope we use those captive audience sort of things Things need to be truly voluntary. I guess that's all I'm saying. Trustee hmm. Decker? I'm going to like betray some like ignorance and, and lack of like deep knowledge here, but I have a question about wanting to make sure that this policy couldn't be used to prevent Native American cultural practices at the beginning of events um, in ways that align with our desire to acknowledge the land that we operate and live on here in the Missoula Valley and in ways that um, sort of center the experience of Native people, which is something that we need to do a lot better job at a lot of the time. So I'm just wanting to make sure that Native cultural practices, which I believe to often be religious and spiritual in nature as well, are that, that we're not inadvertently stepping on those in some way you know and we have a policy on that too in mcps thank you about about what you just authorized yeah being able to do that thank you i don't know the number though but we do have a policy <laughs> all right any other questions or comments on 2332 all right so now we'll move on to 4700 Yep, so 4700 is a result of a change in the administrative rules of Montana uh, that specify that we have to have a family and community engagement policy. Um, and so here it is before you. Um, I think it's actually really, really, really well written. Uh, and if anything, it actually embodies what we strive for at MCPS. So I'm would love more more parents to be involved so is this part of where we had that brief introduction in the handbooks of the schools where we're telling parents you know communicate to the board x y and z because that's not in all of our mcps handbooks just fyi okay. lewis and clark does not have that in there and there's a couple other i'm a parent of lewis and clark so that's why i know that but any other trustee questions or comments Trustee Mercer. I'll make one snarky comment that to me, this would advocate for going back to having parent-teacher conferences in the spring and middle school. Any other trustee questions or comments for 4,700? Uh, trustee Mercer, I, I'm not sure I understood what you, were you advocating for more parent-teacher conferences we, at the middle school? We had a scheduling error two years ago and we needed to make up time, so we canceled them and now we've continued to cancel them. For spring middle school? Spring middle school does not have parent-teacher. No. And I personally missed them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took a note, I got it. All right. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to 1515. Yep, and 1515, again, as a result of ARM, uh, it ties back to the student policy 3225 that we just uh, looked at, uh, but the 5000 series policies are, are uh, reserved for personnel. Um, so this, again, governs all of those uh, bullying, harassment, intimidation, those uh, definitions and reporting uh, requirements that we have to have. So um, another... Uh, policy we're supportive of. Any trustee questions or comments? Seeing none. So this is um, a full board motion 
Is there a trustee that approves a recommendation of posting these for the first reading? Moved by Trustee Decker. Second by Trustee of Garris. Any final comments? Seeing on any public comment on this agenda item. Seeing on all those in favor for approving the recommendation for first reading, please indicate yes by raising your hand. Unanimous to all trustees present. And now we'll move on to item nine, which is the vacant trustee seat update. And um, there's just an announcement that the vacant trustee seat has been advertised in the Missouli and posted on social media and posted on each school's website. Candidates must live within the Lola, Woodman, or DeSmet boundaries and must be a registered voter. Um, individuals interested in applying may submit their letter, which must include their full name, physical address, contact information, why they are interested in serving, attest that they are a registered voter, and answer two questions posted on the district website. They must have their material submitted to turned in by 4.30, Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. Any questions or comments um, from a trustee on that? Anything from the superintendent or clerk on that? No? All right. Oh, Trustee F. Garris. What's our time that we have again before we... 60 days. 60 days. So if we're not seeing good applicants in 30, uh, should we up our marketing in some way to get it out there? Because obviously the last time we did this and it went to the county superintendent, they blasted out there even harder than we did and we actually got applicants. So I guess my question is, should we revisit this a little closer in a period of time and then be a little bit more aggressive in how we're marketing? I would say yes. We'll keep an eye on applications coming in as, as the deadline approaches. If, if we need to do more, we'll, we'll start putting more out there. All right, any other trustee questions or comments in regards to the trustee vacancy? Trustee Decker? Has it, have we, I mean, I, I wonder, I guess, if the superintendents of those districts are aware and maybe could put it in their school communications. Uh, Trustee Mercer. Because it would be interesting the way we are, have people that are bridging our elementary and high school, it would be, I think, awesome to have, that's a double the time commitment, but it'd be awesome to have someone from a elementary board in that place. Is there one? We, we have had that, sorry. Trustee Decker. I'm the worst, I'm sorry. We have had a person who held both seats. I don't know how she did it. She, she was an elementary trustee and then came here to the high school board. But there may be someone in that community, say someone whose student just graduated and they've still got a fifth grader, but now they're also got a high schooler and so, you know, that kind of thing. Any other trustee comments or questions? Seeing none, the time is now 7.33 and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.